Well, good morning. Good morning. That's, that's okay. I think some of you are still a little bit on the dreariness of the day, maybe getting into it, but it's a great day because we're here worshiping the Lord. We have a chance to be here, be with other believers. We still have some folks in from college and some folks visiting, so it's good to see you. I know we've got folks traveling all over as well, but everyone who's here, visitor or guest, if you want to say that better, or a member, at the end of your pews, you see a little black book, a friendship register. If you would, please take that. Put down your name. If you know of a ministry need of some sort, please let us know that. If you've changed your address, your phone number, email address, please indicate that as well. And if you're a guest, if you give us a little more information, we're not going to bother you greatly. We just want to say hello to you and glad that you're here. So please take those friendship registers and pass them down again. Those are checked every week, so it's a fantastic way of getting information to us, uh, kind of a um, pew to pulpit, if you will. If you look inside your newsletter, there are a, not newsletter, excuse me, your bulletin, there are a lot, a lot of announcements. We've got a lot of things going on. And I just want to highlight a few of them real quickly. Yesterday was a very special day for a member of our church. Floyd Burton turned 100 years old yesterday. Now, um, Floyd was unable to be here today. Yeah, he, you tell him we clap for him, if you would. Um, He's got a special party this afternoon, and, and I guess one of the ways you get to be 100 is you pace yourself, and so he was saving up for this afternoon, but the flowers are in his honor, so if you know Floyd, um, everybody should know Floyd, make sure you tell him happy birthday, and uh, thank you to his family for having that here. Um, a couple other things that we really need to, to share with you about. This Wednesday night is January 1st, and so I encourage you to pray for the new year. We'll not be having... Church activities this Wednesday will kick back up on the 8th full swing, but um, just spend some time praying for this new year that's coming up and um, what the, the incredible things that God is going to do in and through it. Also, we have a fantastic thing coming up that you can be beneficial and benefited and be a benefit in three ways. It is the Elvis Visits Mayberry Dinner Theater. So I know some of you just shaking your head. Yep, you can talk to Rod about that. But anyway... If you choose to buy a ticket, which is a good move, and Rod or someone else will be at the back, and you get to buy a ticket, you will get a good meal. You will see a good show, and most importantly, you will be helping to pay for some incredible ministry through the Kentucky Mission Partnership that we have and the trip. And this goes beyond a missions trip. It's a, it's a real meeting of needs. So that's a way to help with that. And then finally, if you're wanting to get your year-end contributions in so you can count them on this year's taxes or whatever, please remember that you either have to bring them by the office by Tuesday or make sure that it is postmarked by Tuesday the 31st. We can't post-date contributions to um, work for, for this current year, so you need to get them in on time. And there will be some, um, the office will be open on Monday and Tuesday um, for you to be able to do that. Now let's do one of my favorite parts of worship. Let's stand up and welcome one another to the service. She's coming. You'll see it. You'll understand why. I wish I had some great story about this stupid foot, but I was just walking. <laughs> so, anyway, take that vitamin D when the doctors tell you to. Let us pray. Our precious and heavenly Father, we come to you today with joyful hearts and loving souls. Lord, I just want to thank you for all the many blessings that you shower on all of us. And you do it abundantly. Lord, today, though, I want to ask that you be with 
um, all of us, but I do know that there are people in this room that are broken a little bit. They are broken either a body or soul, family, work. I ask that today that you remind us where we find comfort. Lead us all back into your loving arms. Allow us to take our needs to you as you have told us to do, but then to leave them there and just rest in your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue our worship now by uh, singing together angels, on the, uh, angels We Have Heard on High. Uh, you'll, see, you'll find the words in, uh, on the screens, or you can look it up in your hymnal at pay, on page 100. Let's sing. I'm going to need both of your help. Let me stand in the middle here. Thank you two for being here. And this is nice because you're going to help me teach all of them something. Because you all caused this problem to happen. I've got a problem today and you're going to help me with it. I turn to the Bible and this story comes from Matthew chapter 13. And I have it down here so you can see where I'm reading. And it's a story about the parable of the soils. And we, a couple of weeks ago, oh, thank you so much. Come right on up here. This is great. You stand, oh, stand right there. Because we learned about the soils. We learned about 
What does that look like to you? It's hard soil. Poke that right there. Poke that right there. What kind of soil is that? Is that hard? All right, we learned about hard soil. And did many plants grow in the hard soil? No, we see a lot of seeds still on the top. So we learned about hard soil here. And then, look at this. This is a mess, isn't it? Can you see what that is? Oh, it's, it's hanging all up. There's briars in here. We learned about thorny soil. Now, in the Bible, we hear that Jesus, come on, we learned that Jesus talked a little bit about we're like soil. Sometimes we have a hard heart. Sometimes we have things in our life that overwhelm us, like these thorns overwhelm the grass seeds. <clears throat> well, yeah, you're going to have to hear this one. That's where it got troubling. That's where something happened that I didn't expect. Because, well, one thing I did expect, doesn't that look nice? There's a lot of plants that grow here. This is the good soil. Now, I treated all these soils alike. This is good soil. We watered them all. We kept put them all in the sun. We treated them alike. Now, that turned out like it was supposed to, too. But something happened. And I've got to be honest with you. This is not in the Bible. I don't want to be honest with you all, but I'll be honest with them. Look at this. Yeah, this is the rocky soil. It has a, you see those rocks down in there? You see all those rocks in there? This wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> it's not supposed to work out like this. See, when you have a hard soil, there's nothing that's supposed to grow there. Thorny soil, it grows there, but then things take over, like troubles of the world and things like that. And, well, and when you have good soil and put good things in good soil, it grows. Like when you receive the Word of God and you listen to the Word of God and Bible studies and preachers and teachers. And then this. It's not supposed to grow with all these rocks. And so I knew I was going to show this to you today, and I, I have to be honest with you. What does that mean? Why did God let that happen? Because I live in a world where God allows a lot of things to happen, to teach us something. And I thought about this, and I thought about the season that we're in. We're in a season right now where we talk about missionaries going all over the world to spread the Word of God. Much like the Bibles we have here, we have people all over the world who don't have Bibles who just would like to have a page of the Scripture. We have many Bibles, and they just like to have part of it. They have to walk miles to hear the Word of God sometimes. That's rocky soil to me. That's hard soil to me. That's dangerous soil to me. And then I remembered something that you all did that day. You put a few seeds in that one, a few seeds in that one, a few seeds in this one, but in this one with the rocky soil, you put a bunch of seeds in this one. You poured handfuls of seeds in here, and that's why this grows so much. Even in rocky soil, when you put a lot of seeds down, you have a lot of growth. And that taught me about missions. Can you imagine about missions? It's about this woman named Lottie Moon that you've heard about a lot. You know about who Lottie Moon is, went to China and was a missionary. This is what we do when we give money to Lottie Moon and to uh, international missions. We put so many seeds out that a lot of them grow. And the more seeds we put out, the more they'll grow just like this one. So this is what God taught me in this example. By the way, the adults have this to remind them what this is all about. There's always soil that won't grow anything. There's always thorny soil, even in our own hearts as Christians. There's always good soil. But most of the time, we live in rocky soil. A lot of things, problems, circumstances overwhelm us in life. But if we read the Word of God a lot, we have a lot of good teachers, and we share this with one another, even in rocky soil, things happen. Would you pray with me? God, we are like this rocky soil. 
We have troubles in our life. People don't treat us like we want it. Things happen that we can't expect. But God, you work through all those things. And above all those things, there is nothing that will stop your will. God, remind us of who we are. But most of all, remind us of whose we are. For it's in the name of our brother Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for reminding me of the story. once again by standing and singing Birthday of the King.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we could come and worship and be with you. We ask, Lord, that you bless these gifts that are about to be given. For we ask all these things in thy name. Amen. God sent his love in the form of man to set his people free. A tiny babe wrapped up in love to save both you and me. Lying there so helpless now, a sacrifice to be. This precious one of Bethlehem, Messiah, King of Kings. Jesus, my King, oh, I will praise Him. Jesus, my King. Now, from a babe into a man, God's promise was revealed. On Calvary he bled and died, and hope for man was sealed. Hanging there so helpless now, a sacrifice is he. This precious one of Bethlehem, Messiah, King of Kings. Jesus, my King, oh, I will praise Him. Jesus, my King. And now I come to worship Him, this babe, the Holy Child. And I will sing His praises, this one so meek and mild. God sent His love in the form of man to set His people free. A tiny babe wrapped up in love that saved both you and me. Jesus, my King, oh, hallelujah. Jesus, my King. King, oh, I will praise him, Jesus, my King, Jesus, my Thank you, Neil. Uh, Russ is enjoying some time off after working uh, tirelessly for uh, so many weeks through this Christmas season doing what uh, they do. He and the family will be traveling to Mississippi, hopefully tomorrow, to spend some time with Russ's folks. So be praying for them uh, while they're away from us. Russ normally does our visual presentations for Sunday morning. So if you have your notes today, you won't be getting clues from the screen. You'll have to listen just a little closer. I'll need to speak perhaps just a little clearer, but hopefully you'll be able to follow and fill in the blanks as you go along if you enjoy uh, taking notes along the way. Now, uh, let me just uh, give a couple of words of, of announcements about what's coming up. 
in January. From uh, my perspective, uh, we're going to begin a new sermon series next Sunday uh, in uh, James. We'll be in the first chapter of James throughout uh, January. Uh, It's entitled, Get Your Mind Right. So we have a new year and a new decade upon us. Let's get our minds right, our hearts right, our spirits right. Uh, so that we can serve the Lord and be all that he wants us to be. I hope you'll be here next week and all through the month of January. And then note uh, in the program this morning the announcement about our Church Memories Workshop on January the 11th. That's a Saturday morning. Uh, We're going to be here from 9 to 11. We're going to have some coffee and maybe some pastries around 8.30 or so for early arrivals. Uh, After our workshop is over, promptly at 12, we'll have... Uh, some lunch for you to reward you for your time here. Uh, But during that Church Memories workshop, we want to look at who we are as a congregation, where God has led us in the past, how that has shaped our identity. And so we'll be talking about significant events and things that have happened in the life of First Baptist Church over the years that have made us who we are. Uh, The traditions that we have, things like the living Christmas tree, uh, the... Christmas Eve service. By the way, I saw some of you posted pictures from Christmas Eve on Facebook. I would encourage more of you to do that. Salisbury needs to know there's an active church here uh, serving the Lord, not just at Christmas time, but throughout the year. And, And the good things going on here, don't be afraid to brag about that and let the community know about those good things. But those traditions did not just pop up out of thin air by themselves and become an important part of who we are. Uh, The ministries of this church did not materialize overnight. The heart for missions that this church displays in so many ways uh, just, again, was not created out of thin air all at once. There's a history behind what makes us who we are, what is the heartbeat of First Baptist Church, and we'll be looking at that, affirming that, thanking God for how he has been with us through the past, through good times and difficult times, but how he has used those events to shape us and make us who we are. That will be helpful to our search committee, again, affirming who we are uh, as we look for the future pastor that will come and lead us in the years ahead at First Baptist. So if you're able to come 9 to 12, January the 11th, we would love to have you here. Uh, All ages, we hope we'll have a good representation from all ages, but We want to particularly have some of you that have a number of years uh, that the Lord has blessed you with, long memories. Maybe some of you had parents that shared stories about First Baptist Church. Those kind of things will be very helpful to us on that day. If you'll call the church office or shoot us an email that you're planning on coming, that will help us to prepare for the right numbers. We're not requiring reservations, but that will be helpful in our preparation. Now, I thought I would be here uh, this morning, at least about around... 9.30 9.30 last night, I thought I'd be here uh, giving a good, loud OH this morning. If you're a football fan, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Unfortunately for the Buckeyes, the Tigers sometime after 11.30, maybe close to 12 last night, made that last drive that clinched the victory for them. And for you Clemson fans, I have to say congratulations. <laughs> for those, uh, those of us that are Buckeye fans, there's always next year, right? But a, a ball game like that, uh, and people that get upset over winning or losing a ball game, uh, those kind of things pale in comparison when we read the scripture that we're going to read this morning. If you get upset over things that uh, are passing in nature, temporary in nature, and you get all bent out of shape over that, but then we read something like this, it helps to wake us up. It's a breath of fresh air to remind us about what really is important in life, and there are some things worth getting upset about. But ball games aren't, aren't one of them, and I'm preaching to myself at this point too. There's some more important things we need to give attention to. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. We're going to begin reading with verse 13. We read on Christmas Eve the first part of the story of the wise men. We'll continue reading in Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. Let's stand in honor of God's word. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the the time of King Herod, 
Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And you know the rest of the story of how they went to Bethlehem and, and bowed down and worshiped Jesus and presented him gifts. Then in verse 13, And when the wise men had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comfort comforted because they are no more. May God add his blessing to our reading, understanding, and application of his word in our lives this morning. You may be seated. Now this is a, a really encouraging, positive portion of scripture to read on, on this Sunday after Christmas, isn't it? But this scripture is real, and being aware of it helps to clarify our understanding of Christmas. We focused on the story of Christmas, of course, during the month of December, about the miraculous things that God did, about Mary and Joseph, about the angels and the shepherds, about Simeon and Anna, the wise men and the star, all giving glory to the newborn king. But Herod's actions provide a stark contrast to what God was doing. The light of love and life had arrived in this world in the form of a baby there in a manger. But immediately what happens? Immediately the darkness closes in and the darkness tries to snuff out the light of the newborn king. We see the very face of evil in the actions of the man called Herod the Great, but he was not great spiritually at all. In fact, just the opposite. But this is not an isolated event in the Bible. In fact, we see a pattern that occurs numerous times in Scripture, and I want to remind you of some of those events that occur in, in this pattern of the, the culture of death that is darkness and evil in the world then and now as well. The clear pattern I think we see, first of all, in the story of Cain and Abel. Remember that God had told the serpent in the Garden of Eden, after he had tempted Adam and Eve to sin, that there would always be hostility between the serpent and the seed of the woman. And he goes on to say that through the seed of woman, though the serpent would strike the heel of her descendants, that her seed would crush his head. And many believe that perhaps this is the first glimpse in the scripture of the prophecy of a coming Messiah who would give to evil a, a death blow when he died on the cross. A Messiah that would not be the seed of man, but a Messiah that would be born to the Virgin Mary, indeed the seed of woman and not of man. So wouldn't it make sense if God had said this clearly to the serpent, and he did, wouldn't it make sense if Satan tried to destroy the seed of woman before her seed ever had a chance to harm him. And so it makes perfect sense that we read about uh, the fall and sin in Genesis 3, that in the very next chapter in Genesis 4, what do we read about? We read where Cain kills his brother Abel, right? And so Satan gets it. He understands that prophecy that was spoken uh, about Mary's seed. And so immediately he begins to bring death into the world and, and causing Cain to kill his brother Abel. But it doesn't stop there. Then in the second book of the Bible, in the book of Exodus, Exodus 
we read about uh, Pharaoh and the Hebrew baby boys. Many generations later, after God had promised that he would bless all nations through the descendants of Abraham, now Abraham's many, many times great-grandchildren are in Egypt. And they're growing in strength and numbers, and God is blessing them. So much so that they become a threat to Pharaoh. And so what did he do? He commanded that all the boy babies should be killed. And when their own parents and their own people wouldn't follow his orders, he commanded the Egyptians to take the Hebrew baby boys and to throw them in the Nile so that they would perish there in the water. And so now we see that Satan is trying to stop a nation from being formed, the nation from Abraham's descendants from which would come the Messiah. Again, he's working in a culture of death to stop what God is doing. Then over 500 years after that, now God's people are in the promised land. The kingdom has been established. Now there is a northern kingdom of Israel, a southern kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem as its capital. And in 2 Chronicles 22 and 23, in 2 Kings chapter 11, we read the story of Athaliah and the royal heirs. Athaliah and the royal heirs. Now Athaliah was the only queen to rule in Jerusalem over God's people as their supreme monarch in biblical times. She was the daughter of King Ahab and many believe Queen Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel, you remember them? Who was this Athaliah? Picture Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, but picture the evil, wicked stepmother. That's Athaliah, except she was the evil stepmother on steroids. That's Athaliah, all right? Like her mother and father, Athaliah worshipped the pagan god Baal. She worshipped Baal. And then in a politically convenient arrangement, her parents agreed with the king of the southern kingdom, Judah, to marry Athaliah to their son uh, so that uh, there would be a political alliance between the two kingdoms. Athaliah was married to King Jehoram of the nation of Judah. This is what the Bible says about Jehoram. Jehoram walked in the way of the kings of Israel as the house of Ahab had done, for Ahab's daughter was his wife. Another verse, a few verses later, says that Jehoram did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Why did Jehoram do what was evil in the eyes of the Lord? Because he followed the... Uh, suggestions and the example of his wife Athaliah and he too became a worshiper of Baal. He wasn't worshiping the Lord, he was worshiping the local pagan deity Baal and encouraging the people to turn their backs on the Lord and to worship Baal. Now Athaliah and King Jehoram had a son. His name was Ahaziah. He became king after his father died, but only a year after becoming king, Ahaziah was killed in a bloody coup when he was visiting the royal family in the northern kingdom, and both the kings were killed at the same time. Now listen to what happened next from 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. When Athaliah, Ahaziah's mother, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to annihilate all the royal heirs. She killed all the royal heirs. Now, what does that mean? That means that she was murdering her own grandchildren and nephews, any that might have a claim to the throne that were descendants of King David. And, and why did she do that? Imagine a grandmother killing her own grandchildren. Why would she do that? It's just a raw grab for power that would make our politicians, even in Washington, D.C. today, as power hungry as they are, it would make them blush. That's what she did. Not only that, she wanted to consolidate the worship of Baal in the southern kingdom. 
She wanted to complete what her parents had done in the northern kingdom. And she wanted the, the uh, Jewish nation now to be a nation that would worship Baal instead of the Lord. But there's more to this story than just a, a raw grab for power. There's something more sinister and evil behind it all. And we'll talk more about that later. But do you see the pattern that we've outlined in, in just this brief jump through the Old Testament? The pattern of, of a culture of death, the pattern of, of all of these things happening in the Old Testament leading up to Herod's killing of the Bethlehem babies. And this evil pattern of death being at work, I think we also see some clear biblical truths that ought to get our attention and ought to cause us to respond appropriately to what went on then. And I think what we'll see still goes on today uh, in our world. Some clear biblical truths from this pattern that we see in Scripture. First of all, we have some children, not as many as usual. We have some young, children and young people. Raise your hand wherever you might be. Teenagers, young people, children. All right, we've got, got some here today. I, I see some not so young raising your hand. That's all right. You're somebody's child. All right, good. The, the first truth that we ought to affirm is we need to be thankful for good parents and family. We need to be thankful for good parents and family. Penny and I are privileged to have uh, daughter Megan and her husband Weston and, and uh, Lawson's here in the service and Cammie's back in the nursery and my cousin Ruth and her husband Bob are here from South Carolina near Clemson, I'm sorry. But uh, they're visiting today. We're just blessed to have good family. And when you have good family, we need to be thankful for them, right? Children, do you have good parents? Don't answer out loud now. I hope, that, I hope you say yes. I hope you answer in the affirmative. Be thankful for the parents the Lord has given you. And even if your parents aren't perfect, and none of us are, are we? Even if your parents aren't perfect, thank God for the good qualities they do have. And many of us here today, adults, we could affirm, no, our parents weren't perfect, but God worked and God used them and used others to bring us to where we are today. And here we are worshiping and serving the Lord. Be thankful for the family that you have. You could have had a mother or grandmother like Athaliah. Be thankful that you didn't. Be thankful for good families. And then the second truth, how can any objective person deny this second truth that evil is real? Evil is real. There's a growing number of people in the modern world, a growing number of people here in the United States that want to scoff at the idea uh, that evil is a reality. And they want to scoff at the idea of, of a personal being called Satan behind that evil. They would have us believe that mankind is basically good, that evil is simply a matter of your opinion and your opinion and your opinion and my opinion, but there's not a universal standard of right and wrong and good or evil. But how can you read a story like that of Athaliah and not agree with the Bible that she was a wicked evil woman. That's what the Bible says. And what she did is the very epitome of evil. You're staring in the face when you look at an event like any of the ones we have read about this morning. Now, is evil still a problem today? Is the world getting better and better and better? Now, our, our news here in the United States does not do, do a very good job of this at all of telling us in reality what's going on around the world. It wants to focus on squabbles and this and that within our own nation. But even as we speak this morning, there is genocide and ethnic cleansing happening in, in a number of places around the world. And it's going on, and we rarely hear about it unless it's happening on some grand mass scale. We're all too aware of terrorism and the mass shootings that are troubling our nation today. We know that there, is many, there are many types of evil going on around us. Children are being abused. The elderly are being taken advantage of. There's human trafficking and innocent people being robbed and killed uh, here in North Carolina in our own communities. If the law enforcement, uh, uh, those in law enforcement in our own church 
uh, could tell us all that they've seen, even in Salisbury, there are things they've seen and experienced they would rather not have seen because uh, of how sinister and evil and twisted they are. Evil is a reality. But listen to me this morning. We don't have to watch the news. We don't have to talk to police officers to see evil. We don't have to talk to others and hear about it from others about the potential of evil. Just look in the morning in the mirror when you get up in the morning. Now I'm not calling you an Athaliah, but I'm saying that the Bible tells us the potential for evil exists in every one of us. And we need to be aware of it. The Bible teaches us that we are born sinners both by nature and we are sinners by choice. The potential for evil exists within each one of us. How many times have you heard about something terrible happen, happening and the people around the person or per persons that uh, committed whatever atrocity it was, those people say something like, I never dreamed that he or she would do something like that. I thought they were incapable of such a thing. And if you would have talked to the person that did it maybe a year ago, maybe five years ago, and you would have suggested that they were capable of, capable of doing something like that, they would say, I would never do something like that. But make a wrong choice here and another wrong choice there and another wrong choice and another wrong choice and evil grows like a cancer and it will control you and consume you and destroy you and others around you if you will let it. Look at the evidence we've seen in scripture just this morning. Because of evil, the world needed a savior to come and confront that evil. That's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem, to confront the reality of evil. And because of Jesus, the evil that is in us does not have to reign over us. Isn't that good? The evil that we're all capable of, we don't have to follow that way. We don't have to give in to it. We don't have to become evil because we have a Savior who conquered evil. Would you just say with me this morning, I have a Savior who conquered evil. I have a Savior who conquered evil. Will you let him conquer the evil that is potentially in your life? today and through this new year so that you might walk with him. This leads us to the third reality that Satan is constantly at work seeking to stop what God is doing. Satan constantly works to stop what God is doing. His aim is to steal the good that God has promised to mankind. He worked diligently. We've seen it here this morning. He worked diligently to stop the coming of the Savior. When the Savior came, he tried to cut him off to snuff his life out even as a baby. But if he wasn't capable of stopping Jesus, he still works to stop what God would do today in the world as people would follow and trust him. Jesus called Satan our enemy, a thief, a murderer, and the father of lies. A thief, a murderer, and the father of lies. Now, how would you like a person like that to move in next door to you? Fathers, if you're, and mothers as well, if you learned that the house that had been for sale and had been empty for a while had sold, and all right, good, we're finally going to have some neighbors, and then you hear, not gossip, but you learn the truth about who's moving in next door, thieves, murderers, and wor thieves and murderers, and all sorts of evil that's been perpetrated by them. Here they're moving in next door to you. What would you do? Would you be happy about them as neighbors? Would you just shrug your shoulders and say, oh, well, no, you'd either do everything to stop them from moving in or the for sale sign would probably go up on your lawn, right? You don't want to expose your family to the potential for harm. Then why in the world, Christian, do we even crack the door when Satan knocks? Why do we even think about allowing some, even what we might consider a small form of evil into our lives when we know the danger that he poses and that he's not satisfied with just getting one foot in the door? Slam the door shut on him. Why? Because the thief, the murderer, the liar, like Athaliah, is a usurper of the throne on your life. Jesus has the right to reign on your throne. Jesus is the rightful king. Throw the usurper out. 
throw him off the throne, crown Jesus as your king today, even as Neil sang about this morning. He's your rightful king. Acknowledge him as your king today. God had promised David that he would always have an heir to reign on his throne. God promised Abraham that through his descendants, all the world would be blessed. A savior would come to save people from their sins, to bring hope and eternal life to all mankind. And this savior would be from the royal line of David. What a magnificent promise God gave. But what of that promise now when Athaliah reigned? Satan had prompted an evil woman to murder her own family, to gain an earthly th throne. But Satan's ultimate desire was to stop God from having the Messiah gain his eternal throne, where you and I would be there worshiping him and praising him with countless millions of others that had trusted him as Savior and Lord. Satan's ultimate desire was, stop, was to stop Jesus from ever becoming the Messiah. Now... No heirs of David left. No Messiah could come. Either the prophets had gotten it wrong, they hadn't heard God clearly, or else God didn't have the power to keep his promise. And if God could be prevented from keeping his promise to mankind, what kind of God would he be? Would he really be God at all if he couldn't keep his promise? That leads us to the next truth. The reality is that God always keeps his promises. God always keeps his promises. Even though many in the land of the Bible had turned away from God, there were many others who were still true believers and worshipped him. Imagine their dismay when the news of what Athaliah had done and that she had murdered the last of David's descendants spread about. But they didn't know something. They didn't know that when Athaliah went on her murderous rampage, that Jehoshaphat scooped up her nephew Joash, King Ahaziah's own son, and she had secretly taken him to the temple where her husband worked as a priest. And there Joash remained in hiding, a legitimate descendant of David, for six years until uh, the priest Jehoiada brought Joash out of hiding and crowned him the rightful king of Judah. And his reason for doing so as Athaliah was deposed and, and Joash was placed on the throne, the priest's reason for bringing Joash out and crowning him king, and the people gladly received him as their king. His reason wasn't because he wanted power and influence for himself, but because this priest knew that's what God has promised. That's what God has declared, that a descendant of David's, not of Ahab and Jezebel's, will sit on the throne. And so here is David's descendant. Here is the child of promise, Joash. God's promise to David and God's promise to us. But Joash was a child of promise for another reason. He was an important link in God's promise to send a savior to the world. And so Joash had to have a, a son before he passed from the scene for there to be a legitimate heir of David who would sit on the throne. And he did. He did. This story is a reminder to us today that at Christmas and all through the year, God always keeps his promises. Are you here this morning and do you need to be reminded of that, fa that fact? God always keeps his promises. Go back uh, through the stories that we've looked at this morning. Cain killed Abel. But what did God give Adam and Eve? Another son. What was his name? Seth. And it was through Seth the promise would be realized. During the midst of all the babies losing their lives in Egypt, God touched the hearts of Jochebed, uh, his mother, and Amram, his father, 
to save the baby Moses from being drowned in the Nile. And then he touched Jehoshaphat's heart so that she risked her own life to save her nephew Joash from perishing. And God sent an angel to warn Joseph of Herod's coming treachery. God always keeps his promises. God always has a plan. That leads us to the last point. Where do you fit in on all this? Is God speaking his promise to you today? Does God have a plan for your life this morning and throughout the new year and for the rest of your life and into eternity? We have a choice to make. We all have a choice to make. We focus this morning on the big picture of of Satan attempting to thwart God every step along the way and, and stop what God was doing on the grand scale. But Satan works in smaller ways too. He wants to thwart God's promises from becoming a reality in your life and your life and your lives and your lives and my life today if he can. He wants to steal away the good things that God wants to do for you and through you in this new year. And he'll do whatever it takes. He'll do whatever it takes to stop God's will from being accomplished in your life. Peter says this, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a what? Do you know that scripture? A roaring lion. Now, if a lion is hungry and something is living and breathing and moving in front of it, do you think you're fair game? Man, if a lion's hungry, he'll eat anything he wants to, right? That's what Satan is like, wanting to devour anyone and everyone. So think about it twice before you give in to that small temptation in this new year. Because evil is never satisfied having just a little bit of your life. Evil wants it all. It'll never be satisfied until it consumes and destroys you. And if not you, perhaps your children or your grandchildren might be destroyed. Watch what this progression that happened in the Old Testament. Jehoshaphat, and yes, that's not an imaginary person, that's a real king of the southern kingdom, Jehoshaphat. The Bible called him a good king, but he made what many people would say was, was just a minor, understandable mistake. He had one of his sons Mary, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, for politically convenient reasons. After all, that's what kings do, right? But Jehoshaphat should have thought twice. Because Athaliah persuaded her husband then to follow Baal. And then later murdered all his heirs, Jehoshaphat's grandchildren. Great-grandchildren. And sometimes... Even a small deviation from God's will can have unimaginable, unplanned, unwanted consequences down the road, even generations down the road. Satan never reveals that part of the picture, does he? He just shows us the pleasure. He just shows the part that will tempt us. He doesn't reveal the consequences to us. I don't know who first uh, offered this quote, but it stuck with me. Sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, keep you longer than you plan to stay, and cost you more than you ever dreamed you would pay. That's the effect of sin in our lives. This morning, will you reject the darkness? And will you turn to the light that is Jesus. Will you say to him, Lord, I I want your goodness, your love, your mercy to flood my life. I want the darkness to be driven out of my life. And I want to live with Jesus as my king from this day forward, serving you and, and sharing and spreading your love and your light to the world around me. This morning, don't let Satan do what Herod could not do. And that's kill the presence of Jesus in your life. Say yes to Jesus. 
Say no to the darkness. Open your heart and life to the Savior today. Father, thank you that you always keep your promises. Thank you that you tell us that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you, Lord, that you tell us that if we receive Jesus, you give us the right to become your own precious children. I pray, Lord, that if there's someone here today that uh, has not responded to that love that you sent in the person of Jesus, that today he or she would open their heart and life and confess their sin and turn away from their sin and in faith receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior and trust him today. And Father, if there are Christians here that have gotten on the wrong path, uh, Christians that have cracked the door open to sin, I pray that this would be the day that, Lord, they would uh, repent as well, uh, that they would renew their commitment to you, that the joy of your salvation would be restored to them, that you would set them back on a right path. Lord, if there are those that need to come to the altar and pray today, if there's someone that needs to come and be a part of this church family by becoming a member. Lord, whatever decision you would place in our hearts, help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit speaking to us even now as we respond in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. If God is speaking to you today, would you respond as we sing? Congregation, you may be seated. Tony, come stand with me. Many, if not most of you, already know Tony Peeler. We are thrilled to have Tony coming today, transferring his membership uh, to us from another church of like faith and order. Uh, Tony uh, met with me oh, a week and a half or so ago, and just very evident how much he loves this church family, how much you have been a blessing to him. And he's already being a blessing to us. He's serving on our security team. And though they work mostly silently and quietly behind the scenes, aren't we glad we have people working in that capacity? 
So, so if you would uh, show your appreciation now as well by saying amen, raising your hand if you're glad to welcome him formally as a part of our church family. Let's see your hand or just say amen or both. Tony, we do welcome you. Thank you. Uh, after, after our benediction, Tony will stand here, come and greet him and welcome him. I bet somebody from your Sunday school class would be happy to come and stand with you. So uh, we'll trust someone from the Sunday school class. We'll do that. And we're just thrilled to have you formally. And we'll be praying for Tony. And Tony's already praying for us. And uh, we'll just look forward to the good that God is going to do among us as we work together. I bet somebody else is here that Tony could be your example today. Maybe you've been attending for a good long while. This is your home. Uh, maybe you need to formally state that and acknowledge that and, and become a part of this body as we serve the Lord together. Tony, would you have a seat for right now? Desiree, would you come and stand with me, please? We come to a, a special moment in the life of any church now when we come together to dedicate a, a family and a, and a young child to the Lord. And this is a special occasion because raising a child uh, is a community affair, isn't it? It takes parents working, it takes church working, it takes schools working, and we have this awesome responsibility as the family of faith. Uh, the church has the privilege and the responsibility of assisting parents in this most important job in the nurturing of our, ch of our children. And so it's appropriate uh, for parents and for the church to unite together uh, in this act of worship. Let me read scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 6. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your soul. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands, and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. We're happy this morning to have James Bruce Carpenter III presented to us this morning. Uh, James is the son of James and Desiree Carpenter. And so, Desiree, you come this morning. And do you desire earnestly that your child, James, grow up in the nurture and instruction of the Lord? Do you covenant to strive to bring your child a knowledge of the scriptures, to teach loving, obedient reverence for God and his son, Jesus Christ, and to work with God's church to accomplish this purpose? And do you dedicate your child today? And as you dedicate your child today, do you also desire to dedicate yourself as a parent to Christ and his church, that you may lead an exemplary life, and in so living may present and commend Christ to your child and to others from this day forward. It's my joy to affirm what Desiree stands here affirming in her own heart and life and home this morning. This is a thing uh, in which I believe our Heavenly Father looks down and smiles because what are we doing this morning? We talked about how Satan promotes a culture of death. What's the church to do? We promote life. And, and life in all its fullness. And when do we want uh, life, not just physical life, but the life and joy that God would bring? When do we want it to begin? We want to teach our children from the very earliest to love the Lord and to serve Him and to experience the blessing of God's activity and presence in His life. So this is a, a wonderful thing that the home and the church are coming together to accomplish this morning. And so First Baptist Church... Do you, as members of the church, promise to join in the teaching and training of this child 
that he may be led in due time to, cr- to trust Christ as his own Savior and to confess him in baptism and church membership. And do you pledge to live your life in such a way that you too will be an example of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ to this young man and this family in the days ahead? If you do agree to that, would you indicate by just rising right now? Let's pray together. Our Father, we just thank you so much for these special moments. We thank you, Lord, uh, for James. We thank you for his mother Desiree and his father James. We thank you, Lord, for just blessing this home with the gift of life. We thank you, Lord, for uh, what an active, exuberant young man he is. Thank you for the positive things that Desiree has shared with me about him. Lord, we believe these are all gifts from you. We pray that your presence and activity would be apparent in his life from a very early age. We pray that you would protect him and bless him and bless his parents as they seek to be the very best they can be for him and for you and for the world around them. Father, we just claim your favor and your very best blessings upon James and this family. And again, we thank you for this time. And we look forward to the day when James also will trust you as his Lord and Savior and become a part of the family of faith. And for that, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And we have a rose to present to the family as well as a certificate. And uh, we, we just congratulate you. And church, would you show your support of this family just by a round of applause. Now. And so if you would like, to, uh, as long as uh, Desiree might have a minute or two before she needs to go claim another one in the nursery, but if you'd like to greet her uh, along with Tony after the benediction, that would be a wonderful thing this morning. Would you join hands across the aisles with someone near you? Let's pray together. Father, it's been a joy to be in your house on this last Sunday of 2019. We thank you for the blessings of the past. We thank you, Lord, for the sure promise of a blessed future as, Lord, our future is centered upon your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Go with us. Make us what you want us to be. Help us to be a blessing. Help your light and the presence of Jesus to glow from our lives even this week. In Jesus' name, amen.